Welcome to the Impact of Educational Leadership talk show hosted by ID3. The Impact of Educational Leadership is an American podcast talk show in Dallas, Texas. ID3 gives an exclusive forum on educational achievement gaps related to student success while exploring relationship and family issues in diverse settings. This is episode 21. I'm your host, ID3. Tonight's panelists are Jose Perez, and he has some special guests. He's a representative of the Texas Organizing Project, short for TOP. Uh, Jose Perez, please say hello to the people. Hey, how y'all doing uh, tonight? I really feel like these kinds of discussions really uh, bring us uh, closer to, you know, building power uh, for our communities. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, well, tonight's topic is should community partners help run and improve our neighborhood schools? The Texas Organizing Project, top for short, works to improve the lives of low-income and working-class Texans through community involvement and community organizing and civic and electoral engagement. TOP is a membership-based organization that conducts direct action in organizing grassroots lobbying and electoral organizing led by working class families in Texas. In addition, they provide training, leadership development, and public education, putting community organizers on the ground and working in communities throughout the state of Texas. These organizers identify issues of common concern. They recruit, they develop, and train leaders. And they build partnerships with community across the great state of Texas. This community team identifies the education issues that are a priority that concern us as a community. Tonight, we have joining us Jose Perez, along with some of his colleagues. Yes, I appreciate that uh, introduction. Uh, and uh, my name is Jose Perez. Uh, I am I'm one of the education justice organizers uh, with the Texas Organizing Project, along with uh, my colleague, uh, Di, uh, Diabasi. Uh, and uh, I think one of the um, one of the points you hit on uh, in the introduction is that we're a member-led organization, and you know we're uh, you know we really pride ourselves in making sure that we uh, develop Black and Brown uh, folks from the community uh, to really uh, gain some material outcomes uh, for uh, for folks. So uh, that's who I am. But I think uh, what I uh, and what we uh, here at Top really value is. Uh, the leadership from our members. So uh, we have two of our uh, leaders in the education team, uh, Ms. Bria Baker and Eric Mata. So I would love uh, for them to introduce themselves as well. Hi, I'm Bria Baker. Thank you so much for having me. I'm a top leader um, and I've been on the team for about two years now. So I'm happy to join the conversation. Hello, uh, my name is Eric Mata. I'm a top leader. I've been with top for for about a year now, and uh, I enjoy uh, enjoy the you know, being involved in the community. Uh, Mr. Uh, sorry about that. Mr. Eric Mata actually just recently was elected to our statewide board of directors uh, for Top. So I wanted to give him a, a great shout out for that, uh, and really uh, would love to see uh, love to see him in that position. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I am enthralled to have each and every one of you on tonight. Bria Baker, Eric Mata, and yourself, Jose Perez. Welcome to the Impact of Educational Leadership talk show hosted by ID3. You know, moreover, researchers have been conducting studies to try to figure out or wrap their minds around uh, how we can help uh, adolescents, the community, develop. So they've been trying to find development strategies in the education system in the United States. 
especially when it comes to or deals with low-income students. I believe this is necessary for us to understand how adolescents process information. So organizations like TOP are very key, they're very strategic in training this leadership development to help equip public education, to help put communities in all communities, not just low-income communities, but all communities to give them a balance, to give them a cutting edge, not just locally, but globally. Jose Perez, I have a question for you, sir, and then each and every one of your panelists can chime in at any time. Uh, we just want to engage in a conversation. But what can the community do to unify our learning centers and facilities with staff that can better understand the responsibility to serve diverse demographics? We know that people uh, were raised differently. They come from different backgrounds, different upbringings, different uh, religious beliefs. And so we need to be able to or responsible for serving this diverse demographic. While school reform efforts have ignored them, what are some ways that TOP is uh, doing, uh, what are some things that TOP is doing to help leaders understand the responsibility to serve these diverse demographics? Yeah, so I would say, or I was going to say, um, I think the first thing to do with to be ourselves, how can we create a better education for black and brown students? Um, and I think the first step to do that would be to understand the problem and to understand the inequities. Um, and you ask, how do you understand those inequities? Because one way you could do it is obviously to hire, and I think this is the common way, is to hire a professional, right? But the problem with hiring a professional is they don't walk those high hallways, and they didn't walk those hallways years before that. Um, you can always assume the students would need, like for instance, you can assume, okay, the students, they don't have the, the technology, they don't have the newer textbooks, right? That could be one assumption that a trans professional would, would take. When in actuality, the students walk in those hallways, they're actually not paying attention because they don't even have central air conditioning. But someone, the students walk in those hallways and the parents knew that. You know, they know firsthand exactly what they're going through. And I think the first step of that would be to understand those inequities, would be to ask them. And participatory budgeting is 100% the way to do that. And that's right now what TOP is pushed for and is pushing for is participatory budgeting to give those students, those parents, those teachers a way to chime in on the way that the money is spent and the budget is allocated for them. What are some ways that TOP can help uh, give and teach uh, the responsibility for uh, students. Well, we're talking about in different demographics, but right now in low-income demographics, how to respect technology, how to respect the textbooks, how to respect the equipment and treat it uh, with worth and treat it with value and, and basically take care of it. What are your thoughts on that? Anyone uh, wants to go first, you can just jump right in. Okay, I can answer. Um, with the respect of the technology and everything, um, I do feel like most schools in Dallas, they right now, they probably, I think that the respect for the, the products will come after the major issues will be fixed. So the foundation has to be built before the emotional capacity can be expected. You can't expect certain things without laying that brick foundation or the cement foundation. I don't know. I don't like bricks, but you, you get my, you get the essential piece of it. Yeah, and also, yeah, definitely. And I also think, you know, with 
you know, with respect to the question, like, what can we do? Uh, I think it's something that, you know, we, you know, we make sure that we uh, do it in our own self, in our own organization. You know, we prioritize, mm -hmm. you know, making sure that in, the, in our hiring practices, you know, we prioritize, you know, people from the community who are black and brown, who are, who are come from the community, who usually uh, don't have that higher edu higher level education, uh, but definitely um, have been uh, through the ringer, been through, uh, been impacted by education, by criminal justice or immigration or uh, any issue that's been uh, been thrown at their way, who, and especially in this historically uh, historic uh, disenfranchisement, you know, we need to make sure that once uh, once we uh, look at ourselves and how we um, interact with the community, I think that's uh, how we're going to make sure that once we uh, do go out there, when we're out there knocking on doors or we're making phone calls uh, in our GOTV programs, when we go out there and, and get them out to vote. Welcome to the Impact of Educational Leadership talk show, hosted by ID3. Uh, we have to make sure that we start locally, and one of the things that we started on was participatory budgeting, uh, where you know students, you know high school students, uh, take a portion of the money uh, allocated to their school and really have a say in how they can uh, improve their school, whether it's new textbooks, whether it's new uh, technology, or basic necessities or uh, even just fresh food at their cafeteria. I think, you know, once we start listening uh, to what the children want and what they want to see in their schools, I think then you'll start seeing that impact on how uh, the, the items will be respected, like you said, and respect, their, uh, respect uh, teachers and, and make sure that teachers are taken care of, uh, especially in their pay. I think that will, uh, I think that will have um, an impact. That's, uh, that's my answer. That's, if you understand what I'm saying. Both great answers. With that being said, let's talk about a little bit before we go into some other questions. How is the training done for your mentors or the leaders in top? What is the training process? How long does it take? Uh, when are the classes? When do they start? Just give us a, a generalized guideline on your, your, your training for your mentors and your leaders. Who, who wants to go first? Okay, yeah, I'll take that one real quick. So I, I think we can just take a step back uh, and introduce a little bit uh, about how we introduced HOP. So, you know, Texas Organizing Project is a nonprofit, a statewide nonprofit that organizes with working families, you know, around education, criminal justice, or immigration. Uh, and, you know, we're not a services organization, uh, but we definitely prioritize, you know, making sure we... Uh, we find solutions for uh, black and brown low-income communities, uh, you know, around education or any issue that is impacting them. Uh, in terms of leadership development, like we don't have a structure where we we develop leaders to run for anything or become anything. We we organize we train them on how to be an organizer. That that's our uh, expertise. So when we're talking about uh, training them on how to you know win uh, an outcome at the school level, at the school board, or at the city council, uh, you know we. We organize around direct actions or uh, public pressures to really find some outcomes uh, for communities. Uh, so we don't really have a program per se uh, to really develop leaders, if you understand what I'm saying. Our development, I think um, Eric and Bria can take this, like, you know, what, what, what we really do is um, really train them to be organizers. That's what we uh, train them to be. We're not really, there's not really a structure on how that's done, if you understand. And with being a leader, I did have the opportunity to take, it's called BCLI, Board of Commission Leadership Institute. It's something new that the Dallas top office um, is doing. And it's basically they train um, women of color, and that would be black and brown, so African-American, Hispanic, um, you know, of color. Um, they train us on how to navigate boards and commissions, and it's specified for, you know, how to, um, fight with the political power and the people power with issues going on that are inequitable for minorities and how to improve our communities. So it's a, I don't remember, it was a, it was a maybe four or five month class and um, we actually graduated recently and um, about a month ago. So that was my experience as far as with learning with talk. Okay, Chris, you want to go? Yeah, uh, Eric, you want to add anything? Yeah, uh, I think what Top does is it uh, 
it, you're able to they're able to find people who are passionate about the issues and you know be able to to kind of help them you know by just asking them to take more responsibilities in the in meetings and doing different activities and and by by them doing that it kind of helps you build confidence and and uh, find your find you be able to find your voice and be the leader like uh for myself you know my day-to-day -day life i'm you know i'm very laid back i'm very just easy going but when it comes to issues like you know education and and, and you know justice for you know minority communities you know i'm, I'm very passionate i understand you know politics i understand government so you know by being involved i'm able to find my voice be able to you know go use you know rely on my passion to help others and be able to channel that towards you know being a leader another great great insight for us and we want to really appreciate you guys again uh, for just coming on to the talk show let me ask you a question here because I, I want to get some you know get some answers to some questions that people are going to want to know from you guys like you know, what accomplishments, because uh, first of all, I've done some research on TOP, and TOP is a very, very vast organization, very powerful uh, entity in not only just Texas, but the world. Uh, but I just, for the sake of the listeners, what are some accomplishments that uh, TOP has done in the past that's noteworthy uh, in this discussion? Who wants to go first? I can answer that one, um, and I'll go with the most recent win. It would be DISD trustees unanimously approving the um, $60,000 pilot for participatory budgeting. And so, you know, our next step would be to expand and to, you know, give that people power, the political power to those families. So that's definitely um, a win for Texas Organizing Project. Yeah, and um, definitely want to give. Uh uh, a shout out to that and give some context about uh, that budget amendment. So, you know, we won $60,000 uh, to pilot participatory budgeting, uh, a process where we give, uh, where a, a budget of the, uh, money is allocated towards students and parents uh, to decide where that money goes through three phases. You know, collection, the collection of ideas, developing those ideas into proposals, and voting uh, on those proposals uh, to really fund uh, projects at their school, uh, at their local school. Um, and that was passed through a uh, unanimous meeting by the trustees, like Bria said, uh, but that was done through the groundwork of, of like years of uh, on the ground talking to folks about making sure that we have enough money, but when we, you know, we obviously do have enough money, it's about prioritizing where that money is going. And I think through this process, it gives the direct uh, access uh, and power uh, to families to really have a say in where their money is going. Uh, and the trustees, I uh, talk about wins, uh, you know, over the last couple of years, you know, we've endorsed trustees, you know, top leaders, top members have, you know, have had a rigorous uh, and vigorous uh, endorsement process to really uh, decide, you know, who's going to be champions on our issues uh, while on their school board. Uh, so, you know, we've in the past, uh, we've endorsed Justin Henry, uh, Carter Garcia, Maxie Johnson, Ben Mackey, uh, and we feel uh, confident uh, that, you know, they're going to be leaders uh, on the school board. Uh, and uh, Eric, uh, I'm sure can give you some other wins, uh, and I can give you some more wins uh, statewide as well. Mr. Eric? Yeah, and uh, prior to PV, one of the uh, participatory budgeting, uh, you know, I was part of the, I worked as a campus manager during uh, the election last year to help and also pushing candidates and also encourage people in Dallas to vote for the, uh, the TRE, which is a uh, uh, tax amendment to get, bring in more money to uh, DISD, and that did that did pass. So, but you know, I took a knocking on doors, talking to people, educating them about you know what it meant, and you know, and everything like that. So that's another win that we had for uh, for top. Welcome to. The Impact of Educational Leadership Talk Show, hosted by ID3. Uh, what would you like 
top to be recognized as accomplishing in the future? What do you want? What's the next major thing? What's the next major project that you guys want to knock out? Who wants to go first? I can take it. Well, I think the next major project is the education side to continue the um, pushing forward with the participatory budgeting process. The sixty thousand dollars that uh, we were, that we got from DISD or DISD is handing out to the to to the different high schools, three different high schools, is a small step. But as you know, you know, sixty thousand dollars to you know, especially with all the older schools in Dallas, is just it's a drop in the bucket. But we think it's a good thing because it'll help encourage. You know, we want to encourage the students, student bodies in these high schools to participate in the democratic process so they can see, hey, my vote actually counts. When I'm advocating for something, it actually counts. So we want to be able to see it go district-wide. So we appreciate, you know, the board giving it, you know, giving the $60,000 to, or for three schools to apply for, but we want to see it district-wide, not just at three high schools. Absolutely, absolutely. And so what are you guys or what is top uh, willing to do to encourage students in the voting process and to get out to be organizers? What are you guys willing to do? I, I, heard, I heard knocking on doors. I heard, you know, mailing, direct mail. I heard a lot of things. But what are you guys willing to do? Are you willing to come out to different schools if you're invited to go out to them? and to recruit uh, or to uh, get uh, kids that you want to mentor or volunteer your services to mentor kids and show them and teach them how to be. Because to me, this is being civically engaged or community involvement. I think they are twins. You know, they kind of mean the same thing. But what are you guys willing to do to accomplish this passion that you have? Who wants to go first? I can go first on this one. So participatory budgeting has already worked in like New York City and Cincinnati and um, I think it was started in Brazil. And so we have an idea of how to do it and right now what we're doing is workshops and teaching strategies um, in districts, in different districts actually in DISD on how they can use their power in the decision making process. and. The high schoolers, they're crazy engaged. Like, it's beautiful to see them actually um, being so engaged in their futures and in, um, in their schools. And moving forward, we're going to continue to do the workshops and continue to teach them. And the end game would be while they're learning and they're doing that participatory budgeting process, they're going to be more engaged in local elections. Because at this point, they're knowing how to do it. They're doing it themselves, actually, you know? So that would be definitely the end game and how we're going to get those students out and show them that they have that power. Welcome to the Impact of Educational Leadership talk show hosted by ID3. Yeah, and uh, I just want to add on that, you know, I think taking a step back, you know, we we're, we want to work, we want uh, participatory budgeting to be a success, and because this is our project and this is something that we feel is going to be impactful in our community. Uh, but we understand at the same time that you know DISD is a bureaucracy. We have to make sure that we have some pilots. Uh, at high schools uh, that will work and become a success and these high school students are already engaged and if we find uh, you know some good high schools to partner with we can really develop some working models to show the district that this can be implemented in every school and once we get to that point where uh, middle schools and, uh, and even elementary schools are being considered I think that's when we can really uh, start developing a real strategy about how to include uh, schools that are not going to have students that are close 
closer to the voting age and, and closer to having developed minds to, uh, to really go through the uh, process because honestly this process is a vigorous process but it's, it's, it's a simple three phase step but uh, in between each step as you know every phase has um, has details that need to be worked out and we feel that high schools are going to be uh, just as good to uh, be have these pilots to become successful because uh, we don't want these three high school pilots to get this money to get these monies uh, for participatory budgeting and not have it work uh, we want this to work and we want uh, to make sure DISD has the tools to make it uh, to make it become successful what a wonderful response uh, my, my question is uh, I guess I'm being a little bit nosy but I'm sure at this point people are going to want to know are there other districts that top is working with besides Dallas ISP and if so could you name them I, I'll do uh I do want to say that we don't work with any district, including the ISD. Uh, you know, we we definitely want to be a partner to the district. Uh, you know, in kind uh, don't uh, in kind volunteer time because obviously, you know, in, in this process, participatory budgeting, we we have the experts on our side. We have done a research on how to implement this process successfully. So we just really want to uh, give uh, the ISD more uh, tools to really have these pilots to become successful. In terms of working with other districts about this. Uh, process um, it's, it's not in our it's not in our view uh, we, we focus uh, on Dallas County we, we focus primarily uh, in West Dallas Oak Cliff Pleasant Grove uh, communities uh, that are uh, usually uh, left behind and that's the areas we're going to be focusing on and uh, all of the ISD whether it's uh, in uh, district uh, district 2 district 8 district uh, 9 or uh, 6 uh, it doesn't matter where it's at uh, so these workshops what we're hosting in every uh, district so last month we hosted it in Oak Cliff with Ben Mackey so this uh, this Saturday November 2nd at Pleasant Grove Branch Library uh, at 2 p.m. we're gonna have a, another workshop regarding participatory budgeting with uh, trustee Carly Garcia uh, it's part of our nine month uh, nine uh, district uh, workshop strategy so we'll have a uh, workshop in every district eventually I, I thought so because the way you guys are organizing your projects they're so well oiled, and I just knew that this is a machine that's growing. It's growing. I want to congratulate you guys in this endeavor. I understand that uh, this participatory uh, budgeting platform or endeavor started in Brazil. I'm not sure what year it started, but uh, of course it's been successful. So this is a global platform that you guys are willing and that you guys are navigating and maneuvering with. I like what Bria was talking about uh, when she mentioned the the organization that she is, when she just graduated from the class of the five or four month um, training that she received for the women of color and how it shows them how to navigate through different systems of government. I think that is very, very crucial uh, to be able to speak the language, to be able to know the verbiage, uh, to know almost like, uh, I don't know if you guys ever heard this, I know you're pretty young, but Kenny Rogers, he said you got to know when to hold him, know when to fold him, know when to walk away, know when to run. And so this is key uh, with politics, and it's so awesome to hear that they have leadership development courses for people of color to, to help them and equip them. I definitely appreciate uh, Bria bringing that up. So, if anyone wants to, uh, if anyone listening, you know, wants to hear more about the uh, Boards and Commissions Leadership Institute, uh, Miss Empress Lindsay is the uh, coordinator for that, and she's in a recruitment phase. So, if you have any woman of color who, you know, definitely wants to get involved in how to navigate these boards and commissions, uh, like you said, I think it will be a game changer. Uh, and yeah, definitely reach out uh, to us if you want to know more and. Uh, yeah, just because I was, it took me a little bit, of, a little bit of while, because I was like, I don't think there's many uh, like that uh, here in Dallas specifically. So, uh, yeah, I want to give that shout out. Awesome, awesome. Welcome to the Impact of Educational Leadership Talk Show, hosted by ID3. And I, I think that's really impactful, and we're trying to. Uh, Right now, I think uh, after our workshop, we're trying to start up a, a community 
service a services fair specifically for DISD uh, for the DISD community. We haven't done it before, uh, but we feel it's, it's a great way to combine our organization and partner with organizations that do provide services and bring uh, folks out, especially during the holidays. It may be uh, it may be in mid December, so we we're trying to start that up and hopefully uh, it gets off the ground and we can really get some families um, linked uh, linked up with uh, services because a lot of times. They don't know uh, that these services are out there, and we want to make sure that uh, the communities that we serve every day uh, really uh, have access to that. And also, could you tell the people, whoever wants to say it, uh, can you tell the people how and what's the process of connecting with you guys as it relates to partnerships? Yeah, so, you know, I like it, like we said earlier, uh, you know, we are a, a three-issued uh, campaign strong here. We have education campaign, we have the right to justice campaign, we have the immigration justice campaign as well. Uh, so partnering with education side, uh, it would be myself uh, and Ms. Diabasi, who is our uh, who is our other organizer here for education. Uh, you can email me, text me, uh, and then uh, right to justice. Partnering at, at David Villa Lobos, he is the Right to Justice Coordinator uh, for TOP here in Dallas County. So you can find him on Facebook uh, or you can hit him up uh, through his email. Uh, and the immigration side, we just hired a new immigration organizer, a migration organizer, I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, she's uh, really uh, starting, uh, really hitting the ground running and uh, she's going to be starting up here soon and you can definitely partner on some uh, migrant rights uh, workshops with her soon so she can email her, or, uh, give her some, uh, we can give her a work number. Uh, so yeah, that's how you can get in contact with us uh, whether you are uh, impacted by any of those issues. And we also have a, a newly formed uh, healthcare campaign that is getting off the ground, who is led, which is led by Teresa Kopp. And they're fighting uh, for Medicare for All. Uh, right to Justice is fighting against uh, ending cash money bail here in Dallas County, which they are in litigation right now. Uh, and uh, our our efforts is, is of course participatory budgeting. And the migration side, they're trying to make sure that uh, folks know their rights when ICE comes to their door, and trying to make sure that uh, Dallas County doesn't partner with ICE in any way. Uh, so that's kind of our main issues for all of our campaigns. Outstanding. Well, we are out of time with that being said uh, give us a takeaway from each panelist who wants to go first i can go first um, the key with anything is involving the community you know, education rights and justice migration is to encourage community to reach out to their elected representatives and let them know about their concerns that they have about what's going on in the community. That's the only, you know, we have to put pressure on the elected representatives to let them know that we're not going to let them just uh, sit in their office and not do anything. Yeah, and I uh, appreciate that. And I appreciate, uh, you know, one of the takeaways is, you know, having these conversations. I really appreciate the time that uh, you allowed us to come on your program and talk about, you know, what we're, uh, what we have going on and, you know, how we're trying to make sure that the community comes together, uh, especially during these times uh, that we're in right now. And I think one of what he, uh, what Mr. Eric was saying about, you know, what we like to say is, you know, we fight with two fists, like Rio was saying, we fight with people power and political power. So that's something that we try to uh, emphasize every day that without people power or without political power, you know, we, we won't be able to find uh, material outcomes uh, for the future. And that's something that I take away. I think the biggest thing that I want um, to take or the listeners to take away would be definitely to always um, be engaged and involved in your community and in your schools. Um, and don't get so weary or don't feel like you don't have a place in politics. Um, definitely exercise your voice. You know, there's no basis on what a politician is supposed to look like or sound like or, you know, be like. It's your community, it's your voice. Exercise your voice. Well, all right, this was another impact tonight of the Impact Let's Get Teresa. This is episode 21. I'm your host, ID3. My panelist tonight was Jose Perez and his friends from the Texas Organizing Project. Top for short. Good night.
Welcome to the Impact of Educational Leadership talk show hosted by ID3. The Impact of Educational Leadership is an American podcast talk show in Dallas, Texas. ID3 gives an exclusive forum on educational achievement gaps related to student success while exploring relationship and family issues in diverse settings. 